We're going to get a little more serious now. Uh, I want to introduce Amantha Tataya, tell you something, uh, pre, uh, preview. We have 50 million people around the world who have neurodegenerative diseases, especially Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, costing about $650 billion a year. And lots of families like all of ours in this room who are or have been affected by these diseases. And there are no cures. There's a, now a global race to find a cure or treatment for Alzheimer's. And uh, Amantha Tataya, new faculty member of the University of Pittsburgh Brain Institute, is going to tell us about her new research and possibly a new avenue toward treating Alzheimer's. Amantha. Um, so can you all hear me? No. no. Um, maybe. Um, now? Yeah. Okay. So first I'd like to uh, thank Glenda for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be here. And it's, uh, it's really an honor and I'm very hum humbled to be a part of this audience. So today um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, Alzheimer's disease. And so I thought I'd begin um, with the self-portraits of a painter um, named William Ute, sorry, um, William Utemolen. Is is there a pointer? Ah, okay. So um, and so in 1967, he was uh, a young man, 33 years of age, and in 1995, he was diagnosed with with Alzheimer's disease, and he decided to. Um, pursue a, a record of his experience um, with the illness uh, through his artwork. And so um, I think the resulting body of work shows a very unique um, artistic, personal, and medical record of one man's struggle with Alzheimer's disease as he adapts to the growing uh, limitations of his perception and uh, his motor skills. Um, his wife and doctor said that he was aware that technical challenges were creeping into his work. However, he, didn't, he couldn't figure out how to actually fix the mistakes. And by um, 2000, his um, memory and motor skills had deteriorated to the point where um, his self-portraits were just mere blurs of himself. And at that point, um, he was moved to a nursing home and six years later, um, he died. So I think um, this clearly shows the helplessness and the uh, loss of self that uh, a person who's suffering with Alzheimer's uh, develops. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia in the elderly. Um, it's responsible for about 70% of all dementias. Um, pathological changes begin decades um, before the actual onset of clinical symptoms. Um, and there are several risk factors involved in the development of the disease. So age is the primary risk factor. So 2 to 3 percent of people uh, age 65 years or older have Alzheimer's disease, and by age 85, that number goes to reaches about approximately 50 percent of people. So age is the single greatest risk factor for AD. However, gender is also a risk factor. Females are about two-thirds more likely to develop AD than men. Um, environmental and lifestyle uh, factors also play a role. So smoking and drinking are not so good for, for development of Alzheimer's disease, whereas have, living a healthy lifestyle, exercise and hiking and biking and stuff in, uh, in Aspen would be great for that. Um, other factors such as education, um, intellectual activity, social activity, such as being here today and learning new things are good to stave off the risk for the disease. And also um, there's a growing body of growing body of evidence that shows that um, people with brain injuries or TBI have an increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So in addition to these factors, there's also genetics that does play uh, a role. So in early onset AD patients, or familial Alzheimer's patients, these patients generally have mutations in, um, in these two genes called APP and presenilin, which I will talk more about in, in a couple of minutes. Late onset AD patients, um, which are around 65 years of age, they also just seem to have genetic risk factors for AD, and they are about eight to 10 times more likely to uh, develop AD than people who don't have uh, mutations in this APOE gene, for example. Okay. 
So um, in the United States, uh, as of 2014, approximately 5.2 million Americans were suffering uh, with the disease. Of the people who are 65 years of age and older, 3.2 million are women and 1.8 million are men. So by 2050, the worldwide total number of AD victims is expected to exceed 100 million uh, individuals. So it's, a, it's really a growing uh, epidemic that we need to address. Um, and the cost of care for Alzheimer's disease patients is also quite astounding. So in 2015, $226 billion was spent in caring for AD patients in the U.S. And out of, of that, $36 billion was spent as out-of-pocket expenses from families. So if we, in the United States at the moment, we have a growing um, baby boomer population. That's about approximately 70 million individuals, and they are rapidly uh, reaching the age for, uh, uh, for developing AD. And if the, we do the projections, we find that in about 2020, AD has the ability to totally consume Medicare and Medicaid in the United States. Okay? And by 2050, the estimated total cost is about $1.2 trillion. So this is uh, a staggering uh, debt. Um, so if we put this in the context of the world, as of 2010, the worldwide cost for Alzheimer's disease was $604 billion. And if dementia were a country, it would be the biggest country in the world, much greater than the revenue, much more revenue than Walmart or Exxon. Okay, and sorry, oops, sorry. Um, and so the 604 billion represents about 1% of the world's GDP. And if, so if Alzheimer's disease were a country, it would actually be the 18th largest country in the world, okay, uh, between Turkey and Indonesia. So um, I just wanted to put things in perspective of other major diseases uh, in the U.S. So the mortality, Sorry, the mortality rates for um, diseases such as cancer, heart disease, and HIV have steadily gone down in the last uh, 15 years, whereas the mortality rate for Alzheimer's disease patients has dramatically gone up. And if we do the comparison relative to the amount of uh, uh, funding distributed by the National Institutes of Health, what we find that is that the funding for um, Alzheimer's disease research is only uh, five to ten times is five to ten times less than that of other major diseases um, that are uh, heavily researched in the U.S. So we definitely need more research money to go into AD research. Okay. So um, currently there are five um, available therapies for AD, uh, and there are uh, two classes of therapies. One of these, sorry. Uh, I'm really sorry. There are acetylcholine, recept uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, and basically they prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine and they improve neuronal communication. The other class are NMDA receptor antagonists, and basically they prevent the excessive release of glutamate in the brain, and this blocks uh, uh, neuronal overstimulation. Unfortunately, both of these uh, drugs, or these classes of um, therapies, they only provide temporary symptomatic relief, but they do not treat the underlying disease. Sorry, one second. So there is hope on the horizon. So there are many, sorry, there are many um, drugs that are in preclinical, pre phase one, phase two, or phase three uh, clinical trial studies at the moment. However, unfortunately, in the last five years of the six AD uh, phase three clinical trials that have um, been undergone, all of them have failed due to, um, didn't fail to display significant benefit. Uh, and most of these studies were due to uh, insufficient translation from preclinical to clinical science. So what can we do about this? So rather than um, tell you about uh, exactly what's happening in the brains of AD patients, I decided that I would show you uh, a, a short video. Or play. <laughs> Please.
and there should also be volume. Sound. Yeah. So basically, um, I think uh, what this part of the video is showing is that there's a disruption in neuronal co communication between neurons as the disease uh, progresses and as this communication is, is starting to break down. Uh, you see these neurons firing. And you have the formation of these amyloid plaques between uh, the neurons that then um, possibly secrete substances that trigger this, the, uh, the generation of the surrounding neurons. In addition to amyloid plaques, there's also these things called neurofibrillary tangles. That's also a, a pathological marker of the disease. So in the disease, um, we have this protein called the amyloid precursor protein, and it can be cleaved by um, this protein called the alpha secretase, and then another protease uh, enzyme comes along called the gamma secretase, makes another cleavage in the protein uh, to release uh, a small peptide that's relatively innocuous and not associated with amyloid pathology. However, the secretase called beta secretase comes along and then the gamma secretase cleaves this uh, fragment. We have release of these peptides that have been uh, shown to be very sticky. They stick together, they form these aggregates which then um, accumulate in the brain and deposit as amyloid plaques. So in addition to the um, deposition of amyloid plaques in the, ba in, the, in the brains of these patients, we also have a protein called tau, and it's normally for, for, uh, found along these microtubules. But what happens during um, Alzheimer's disease, it becomes hyperphosphorylated. And it starts to also um, become sticky and also uh, form aggregates in the brains of AD patients. I think we can, it's okay, I think we can go ahead and stop it. Okay, so just to basically summarize what was shown in the video. We have um, this protein called um, APP, amyloid precursor protein, that's cleaved by the beta secretase and this, uh, another protease called the gamma secretase to generate the A-beta peptide, which aggregates to form amyloid plaques in the brains of AD patients. Okay. Um, so we were looking for alternate therapeutic avenues to, uh, to target uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so a few years ago, um, we performed a genetic screen with a full-length human cDNA library to identify therapeutic targets for AD. And based on this screen, we identified this uh, G-protein coupled receptor called GPR3 as a primary modulator of A-beta generation. And we did a number of in vitro studies in cells in primary neural cultures to uh, validate that GPR th increased levels of GPR3 lead to an increase in A-beta generation. We then decided to take these studies to a more in vivo model. And so to do this, we looked in mice. Mice don't normally uh, develop Alzheimer's disease, but if you introduce uh, the human transgenes for APP and presenilin, they do develop amyloid plaques and they display uh, cognitive deficits. So um, in this mouse model, so this is a cross-section of the mouse brain, and the structure in the middle is the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory in AD. And so in uh, 
in this AD transgenic mouse model that expressed GPR3, you see um, in blue, the, those are the nuclei, and in green are the amyloid plaques, an abundance of amyloid plaques. However, when we genetically deleted GPR3 in this mouse model, we saw a dramatic reduction in the amyloid plaque burden. But to go along with these studies, we also wanted to know whether what effect the absence of GPR3 would have on uh, cognition in these mice. And so to do this, we used uh, um, a very commonly used behavioral paradigm called, called the Morris water maze. And so basically we put a, a mouse in a pool and we divide the pool into quadrants and the pool has opaque water and in one corner of the, one of the quadrants of the pool there's a hidden underwater platform. And so basically we take 10 days and we determine how long it takes the mice to, to find the hidden platform. So with increasing number of training days it should take them less time to find the mice. And so in the uh, AD transgenic mice that express GPR3, these mice don't really learn where the platform is with increasing training day. However, in the absence of GPR3, we see a dramatic uh, reduction in the amount of time that it takes the mice to find the platform, indicating that they are learning where it is and that the absence of GPR3 in this AD mouse model leads not only to a reduction in the amyloid plaque burden, but also to uh, an alleviation of the cognitive deficits in an AD mouse model. So in order to verify that this was not just an artifact of the AD mouse model we were studying, we also looked at this in four different uh, AD mouse models. And in all the models that we studied, we saw a reduction in the plaque burden and an alleviation of the cognitive deficits. And these studies have now uh, shown the highest level of valid validation for any therapeutic target for AD to date. Okay, so um, to go along with these studies, what we also did was to develop a method to actually look at um, amyloid plaque burden in the structurally intact mouse brain. So we um, were able to develop a technique to render the entire mouse brain clear and the, uh, transparent, and then we um, labeled these mouse brains for amyloid plaques, which is these little dots you see here, and the cerebral vasculature. So in this way, we could look at the amyloid plaque a burden relative to its surrounding cerebral architecture. And what we've now do, done is extended these studies to look at the effect that the amyloid plaques have on the surrounding neurons, glia, and astrocyte, and how this crosstalk is happening to cause uh, neurodegeneration. Okay, that's basically it. Um, so this is fine and great, and so maybe we've cured Alzheimer's in, a, we have a cure for Alzheimer's in an AD mouse model, but what about humans? So what we then did was to look in uh, human AD patients, brain samples, and what we found was that in a cohort of human AD brain samples, there's an upregulation of GPR3 expression. We also wanted to know whether the increase in GPR3 expression correlated with the severity of the disease or disease progression. And what we found was that with increasing severity of the disease, you do see um, an increase in GPR3 expression. So in humans, in two different cohorts of patients, we also find that uh, expression of GPR3 is elevated. So suggesting that GPR3 is indeed um, a valid therapeutic target for AD. And so we've also now done studies to um, look into the mechanism of action. And what we find is that the mechanism of action through which we get, gen get from changes in expression of GPR3 to changes in amyloid pathology is also shared with other GPCRs that have also been implicated uh, in AD. So this work probably has broader relevance than just for GPR3 alone. So the next steps would be to develop a drug discovery uh, and development program to screen for compounds to selectively inhibit GPR3 activity. And actually, so where we are now is right here. We've identified a, a target, uh, and we'd like to now begin compound testing. And then this will go through in vitro uh, and in vivo uh, model studies. And then hopefully at some point in the future, we will arrive at uh, clinical testing. Uh, so it's a long road, but uh, I think um, with the solid foundation that we've developed, I think we're, we're, we're on a, uh, a good path. So I'd like to thank you for your attention.